Hey everyone, thanks for joining me today in session 128, and I am joined by none other than Dr. Mary Jane Weiss from Endicott College. We're going to talk about the evolution of the practice of applied behavior analysis and really hone in and talk specifically about the preparation of tomorrow's behavior analysts. This is the second interview that was recorded live during the Virtual Behavior Analyst Leadership Council Conference that was held in April of 2020. I would be remiss if I didn't thank the BALC for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, Dr. Weiss is a professor, at, like I said, at Endicott College, where she serves as the Executive Director of Programs in ABA and Autism, and is the Director of the PhD Program in Behavior Analysis. She has worked in the field of ABA and Autism for over 30 years, and Honestly, it would take too long to go through her professional accomplishments and accolades here, so check out the show notes at behavioralobservations.com for a more comprehensive bio sketch, as well as for links to other papers and resources we discussed during the interview. In this interview, we discuss what the practice of ABA was like when she was coming up in her training and early career, and then trace that arc up to what she's doing these days as the Executive Director of Programs at Endicott. We also discuss what she'd do to change the training of new BCBAs if she had the proverbial magic wand. Uh, we talk about why she really likes teaching online, what makes for good instructional design, how to improve the quality of ABA training more generally, why it's important to have broad philosophical and conceptual uh, training and behavior analysis, how to work well with other professions, and her thoughts on the autism-centric perception of our pr- profession. And If you listen to any part of the podcast at all, be sure to listen to her closing advice for BCBAs of all experience levels. In short, if you're interested in where our field is going, this is the podcast for you. I want to make a couple other quick announcements before we get to the interview. I'd like to thank longtime listener Jim from Colorado for helping me prepare for this interview. Uh, Obviously, Balk for making this opportunity happen and the following sponsors. Um, The first one is the 2020 New Hampshire Association for Behavior Analysis Virtual Conference. Yes, even though it's New Hampshire ABA, you can participate regardless of where you live. The 2020 event is going to be awesome. The speakers list includes Dr. Solande Forte, Deb Grosset, Bridget Taylor, Alyssa Wilson, Camille Kolu, and Emily Sandoz. There is flexible pricing, as New Hampshire ABBA acknowledges the impact that COVID-19 has had on a lot of people financially. Uh, There's a lot more information over at nhaba.net. That's nhaba.net. So I hope you choose to join us virtually on September 26th. We're also sponsored by my friends at Praxis Continuing Education and Training. They have two great ACT and RFT classes coming up that seem really cool. Understanding and Using Relational Frame Theory for Behavior Analysts and Acceptance and Commitment Therapy with Parents. These are live online courses where participants can ask questions, get feedback, etc. on the spot. So for more information, go to praxiscet.com forward slash B-O-P-O-D. And if you purchase these events, be sure to use the code OBSERVATIONS to save some money at registration. And last but certainly not least, Behavior University, their mission is to provide university quality professional development for busy behavior analysts. You can learn more about their CEU offerings and podcast specific discounts over at behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And I'll have all the links to these in today's show notes. So just head over to behavioralobservations.com and look for session 128. Okay, that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, let's get right to this interview with Dr. Mary Jane Weiss. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Matt Sicoria from the Behavioral Observations Podcast. And I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Mary Jane Weiss of Endicott College. Uh, Mary Jane, this is truly an honor to chat with you. It's a, uh, you know, I've been doing the podcast for almost five years now, and I think this conversation is many, many years overdue. So I'm just, again, thrilled to have you here with me. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. There's a lot of buzz about your work, so I'm glad to be part of it. 
Excellent. And uh, before we get rolling here again, I just want to thank uh, everyone at the uh, Behavior Analyst Leadership Council for uh, inviting us to to do this, uh, as well as all the sponsors and all the hardworking people behind the scenes. So uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that. So, uh, but um, man, do I have a bunch of questions to ask you? Uh, but what I like to do is start every show with talking to folks about how they discovered behavior analysis. And so uh, I was thinking we can start there with you. Uh, and what I'm really interested too is, is if you could kind of paint a picture of what the behavior analysis scene is or was at the time and uh, provide some perspective in terms of how things have changed so, so, so much in, in, in those years. So, uh, so why don't you uh, lead us off with that, please? Sure. So um, I kind of think that my my start, I would go back to my undergraduate days and I was a psychology major and um, I was introduced really to then what was probably more commonly called behavior modification or behavior mod approaches to various kinds of things. And um, I was really drawn to it, especially in comparison to some of the other more mentalistic and um, introspection oriented kinds of parts of psychology. I really loved the focus on making real world changes. Um, But I think what really happened in my undergraduate years was an internship that I got. And I was placed at a at a center for very, very severely ADHD impacted kids. And um, it was kind of an unusual opportunity where I shadowed a psychologist who was um, very behaviorally oriented and who was doing uh, parent training as well as staff training in the context of a program that they ran right there. And what I saw was the power of behavioral intervention. Because there were kids who in the intake were literally climbing the walls. I mean, basically on the ceiling. And in a matter of a couple of weeks, with good contingency management, um, families felt empowered. Staff were able to get them to do all kinds of, of activities and skills that would help create the foundation for learning. And the trajectory of their lives was totally different. And I I felt like I got to see that up close. And I was like, this is unbelievable. And it sort of solidified for me both, um, you know, my commitment to behavioral intervention and my desire for graduate education. And then when I decided to go for my graduate education, um, it was a bit accidental that I ended up in autism. But what I was looking for was behavioral intervention and um, preferably with children with special needs of some kind. And I was offered admission to the program at Rutgers University under the mentorship of Sandra Harris. And I had not had any exposure to autism in my undergraduate days. But during my interview, I visited the Autism Center. I thought, this is amazing, and this would be really, really cool, and I would learn a ton. And so I kind of feel like that part of it was an accident. Um, but it was a, a place where then I developed sort of a dual passion for applied behavior analysis and its application to autism. I see. And, and so, um, what what were the um, what were the opportunities like as as a either a, a, a graduate student or a or a young PhD at the time? Uh, you know, I. I um, I got out of graduate school in the late nineties myself and uh, you know, the, the job opportunities were so few and far between. And I always feel like I have to point this out because we're, you know, this pandemic, notwithstanding, we're in this embarrassment of riches of sorts where, you know, and if you have a BCBA uh, if you have those letters after your, your, your name, you're getting, you know, 15, 20, probably more emails a week recruiting and things like that. Can you talk about what it was like to, uh, practiced your craft, if you will, at, the, at that time? I feel like we were sort of a, a very few in number and very under the radar kind of community. Um, you know, we knew who each other was. We were excited about each other's work, but it wasn't something that had a lot of value or recognition associated with it, um, even within broader professional communities, certainly not with the public at large. I think no one really knew 
applied behavior analysis. If anything, it was more of a BMOD kind of world. They would sort of understand you as, as doing behavior modification. And when I would tell people that I worked with individuals um, who had autism, you know, at that time we would often not use person first language. So we might say autistic kids. Sure. They um, typically would think that you said artistic kids and they'd be like, oh, really? Cool. What kinds of stuff do they make? Um, yes, I've so, had that. <laughs> I've encountered that before, for sure. Um, and even just in terms of our own profession, in terms of the definition and the credentialing of it, um, you know, I, um, I, I went to school before there were ABAI accredited programs, let alone BCBA certification. Sure. And so, it was, as I said, just kind of this small underground community. And what really changed it, in my opinion, um, was the publication of Let Me Hear Your Voice. At that point, I was outside of graduate school. And um, I was practicing at a program, a specialized program for individuals with autism. Um, and um, that, to me, is when the demand for our services changed. And I can tell you, we were overwhelmed. We were a sleepy little, quietly doing our cool thing program that became overrun almost overnight with requests for intervention from parents who had read the book and learned that there was something that might help more than treatment as usual for individuals diagnosed with autism. Yeah, you know, I don't think it could be overstated how much a game changer that book was for uh, for sure. Um, so, uh, so let's kind of, I guess, roll the tape as it were. And, you know, as we're kind of moving forward time wise, I, I would love to get your comments or perspective on the, the growth of the field with particular focus, perhaps on the last five to 10 years. You know, we've had this, uh, you know, exponential expansion uh, and you know, I, I heard a stat that's thrown around sometimes. I'm not sure if it's completely accurate, but it, you know, it, it um, it's interesting to think about regardless of that, you know, sometimes something like half of the BCBA practitioners have been certified in the last five years. Um, so w what, um, you know, we have these, these uh, insurance funding, you know, streams that, that are available now that have created these unbelievable opportunities. Um, but I think it's fair to say that these are challenged. There are challenges that come along with that as well. Uh, can you comment a little bit on the uh, on those challenges we 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 do face? Uh, you know, especially with regard to this, you know, very very fast growth of the field. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's been really awesome, and it's also been kind of concerning, right? for all of us. And, and I think we're all in that together in terms of maybe never being able to envision just how much it's grown and how much it would be sought after. And then also recognizing we weren't cr quite ready as perhaps no community of providers could have been for the increase in demand for our services. And, and I think with those challenges come opportunities, but also come risks. And I do think that the two things that probably we all worry the most about are related to training and related to quality of services. And, and I don't think that those are um, specific only to our profession or specific only to the growth that's happened in our profession over the years. I think um, any new field that becomes high demand faces similar kinds of challenges in that context. I, I kind of see it as um, the answer is continually shaping the requirements for certification um, and the quality indexes over time. And, and I do think that if you study, for example, what our field has done in that context, it's basically a meta example of shaping uh, in terms of looking at increasing the requirements. I look at certification started as a, you know, four core sequence, five core sequence, six core sequence, seven core sequence. Um, supervision used to be a, a very informal affair. Uh, and now there's a lot of rigor and responsibility and clarity attached to those requirements. And, and I feel like I have a lot of hope that those things will continue to 
improve and increase in ways that that try to protect us from some of what could happen in the absence of those movements. Hey, everyone. Just want to jump in here for a quick break. In case you missed it at the beginning of the episode, Praxis Continuing Ed it has two classes coming up in ACT and RFT. One is Using Relational Frame Theory for Behavior Analysts with Drs. Siri Ming and Tom Sabo. And the other is Acceptance and Commitment Therapy with Parents with Drs. Lisa Coyne and Evelyn Gould. These are live online courses where participants can ask questions, get feedback, etc. right on the spot. So for more information, go to praxiscet.com forward slash B-O-P-O-D. And if you decide to check it out and enroll in the courses, use the code observations to save some money at your registration. And this information will be available in today's show notes as well. All right, let's get back to Mary Jane. I see. Uh, with with regard to the the, the training piece uh, and you know the the, the um, uh, as you say shaping up of the the different requirements for for board certification over time. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but um, what if you were to kind of wave your magic wand? Um, you know what would be some things that you would uh, add to that or, or, or take out or change? Uh, does anything come to mind? Uh, and again, I realize I'm putting on the spot. We can come back to this in a bit if you want. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, I always have ideas. <laughs> I'm okay. not sure I should right. say them out loud. But oh, I no, we want you to say them out loud. That would be great. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm kind Let's of make interested. Some news here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of interested in what some other fields do. Like, for example, um, I'm really interested in speech and language pathologists, and they have this fellowship year where people work for an entire year under very close supervision and mentorship after they're done with all of their education and training requirements. And I've always looked at that with a lot of interest in terms of um, the logic of taking a newly minted professional, but giving them a little bit more of a safety net. Mm -hmm. in terms of help in making the tough decisions and evaluating the progress in individuals who might be struggling and all the more complex challenges that we face as new professionals. Um, And, you know, that is literally like off the top of my head and it's only, it only exists in Mary Jane's mind. It's not like I have any inside information or have talked to anyone else field. But I sort of love the idea of some kind of a way of supporting the newer professionals for a bit longer in some kind of um, formal way. I think that a lot of good centers do that. But I think that it would be great if everyone had access to something like that. That's a fantastic idea. You know, uh, where I live in New Hampshire, Dartmouth College is about, you know, 40 minutes up the road. And uh, I uh, have a friend of mine who uh, went to med school through their uh, system. And, uh, you know, the whole idea of, um, you know, kind of their, um, I forget the specific term, the, 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 the fancy doctor term for it, but basically they go through rotations in different right. departments uh, as uh, as residents, I suppose. I don't know if that's the the correct uh, level of of training in which they get to do that sort of thing. But you know, so he he you know did a little bit of uh, work in uh, pediatrics for you know like six weeks, and then went into you know, um, uh, some other you know car, uh, cardiology, and then so on and so forth, dermatology. And so the idea is that you know when he left the, that program. Uh, he was, uh, he had exposure to a lot of different areas of medicine and I sometimes wonder, you know, in the same way, you know, uh, if there would be a, a, a scenario someday where, you know, newly minted BCBAs could go, you know, spend, you know, a few weeks doing some, um, feeding, you know, stuff that a lot of us don't get exposure to, you know. Or even FAs, the literature tells us that a lot of people, even who are credentialed, don't have adequate experience or exposure or certainly supervised training in even some of the things we consider to be Monday and everyday tasks of behavior analysts. Oh, yeah, you're so right. Yeah, there was uh, two surveys that came out a few years ago in Java that that, that had some very uh, disconcerting uh, data in it regarding uh, the the use of functional analysis, or, or in this case, the lack thereof. 
uh, yeah, that and you know a precision teaching rotation, you know, and you know we can go down. We can create a probably a we could rough out a list here pretty quickly of at least a half a dozen different specialty <laughs> if it was up areas. To us. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, yeah, I just have to imagine what the infrastructure would be like to to uh, to 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 manage that process uh, in uh, you know especially given the the rate at which we're we're um, creating BCBAs. So. Um, um, so that's a that's a fascinating answer, and I think it's something, at least in my humble opinion, worthwhile uh, thinking about as as we uh, uh, train train new practitioners. So, hey, it's Matt jumping in again. I just want to give you a quick reminder that the 2020 New Hampshire ABBA virtual conference is coming up on September 26th. This is an amazing event. All the details are over at nhaba.net or in today's show notes at behavioralobservations.com, session 128. There's a great lineup of speakers, and the pricing is flexible in recognition of the economic impact that COVID-19 has had on many behavior analysts. So again, check it out at nhaba.net. And I hope to see you there, virtually, of course, on September 26th. I'd like to I, pivot to a, a related topic, and that is... Um, you know, you're work at Endicott right now. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing uh, and what your role is at uh, Endicott? Sure. Um, I've been at Endicott about nine years, and I am the executive director of programs in ABA and autism. I um, am the director of the PhD program in applied behavior analysis there, and I also oversee the master's programs that um, we have at Endicott as well. Um, I love it. It's been a lot of fun. Um, Okay. So related to that, you know, I was looking at the Endicott website and the, the, uh, particularly with interest to the ABA programs. And it's kind of funny to say this out loud now that everyone's kind of quarantined, but you know, it's like we offer online hybrid and in-person classes. Uh, and obviously everything's moved online, or at least I'm assuming most of your stuff is, is online these days. Um, but even pre pandemic uh, w- with so many online graduate training programs that are that are popping up. Um, can you talk a little bit about what makes a good online learning experience or what have you guys learned either through trial and error or for, from, from study or some combination of both? Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, it's, it's one thing to, uh, you know, to kind of lecture with a PowerPoint behind you, you know, and things like that. But if you can kind of walk us through at least what the philosophy of Endicott's instructional design is, that would be great. I'm so glad you asked this. I, um, you know, it's kind of hilarious in a way because, um, you know, I feel like the, the the one thing that maybe will come that is a silver lining from COVID-19 is it has normalized online instruction and online engagement in a variety of academic and work contexts. And that's just been interesting for me to see because one of the things, you know, I taught for 16 years exclusively face-to-face before coming to Endicott. Um, and I have a tremendous love for and appreciation for all instructional formats. I still teach face-to-face. I teach synchronous online. I teach asynchronous. Um, For me, um, but I think I'm a minority in this opinion, but I don't really understand why. For me, it's all about instructional design. It's not about format. And I really believe that. I really think that you can create a fantastic online class. You can also create a fantastic face-to-face class and you can have poor exemplars in both of those as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated because we're behavior analysts and um, we're so focused on data reportedly. I'm fascinated by the assumptions and the strength of opinion that I have encountered in my move to include online instruction as part of what I do. And, um, it's just surprised me. I mean, from my perspective, I think it's all about pedagogy, right? And how we build what we're trying to teach, regardless of the format. Just as an aside, there are two things I discovered moving to online forums that I prefer uh, compared to my face-to-face experiences. One is that nobody makes off-the-cuff comments. I love that. 
I love that. I, because in a face-to-face class, sometimes people raise their hand and they say something that isn't well formulated, that isn't grounded in what we've been studying, but it's just kind of off the cuff. There's very little of that when there's a permanent product. When your discussion is a written product that's going to be there for all to see, there's a lot more judicious thought and use of literature in framing what people contribute. The other thing I really like it, if you've structured the course appropriately, um, is that there aren't any silent students, that you've created a requirement for every voice to be heard in those discussions and in those contexts. And as somebody who has you know, spent so much of my career teaching and struggling to engage the less engaged learner, I see real possibilities in online formats to improve and equate that, that I've been really pleased by. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, that what we really need to do is figure out what are the components of instructional design that lead to better learning outcomes. And it doesn't matter what forum or format you're talking about. We need to understand more about what works and we need to study which approaches, which elements and which formats are related to the best outcomes. We're doing a tremendous amount of investigation into those molecular questions within Endicott's program. And it's been really exciting to try to be guided by data. You know, what is the value of the, um, of the discussion forums in an online class, if there is any? Is it better to do study questions or interteaches? Is synchronous, does synchronous offer something better in terms of learning outcomes compared to asynchronous? These are all empirical questions. They are all questions that need to be answered with data and not out of assumptions. So I think we have a great opportunity. I hope a lot of people join me now that we're all going to be online a lot more. <laughs> yeah, sounds like some exciting opportunities for sure. Um, there's a, a, a number of thoughts I have based on that that quite expansive response there. Um, w- <laughs> one is um, if if we have listeners in the audience or viewers in the audience who are being um, tasked with designing some sort of instructional uh, online module or lesson, or or maybe they've taken the the dive into you know being a an adjunct professor or or something along those lines. What would be some instructional design? You know, did, is there is there a, a good uh, like instructional design one hundred and one, or what are some key terms, or or mm. uh, you know where either where can folks go, or what are some things folks want to think about? Uh, if they're encountering this type of work for the first time? Um, That's a great question. And I do think that we have things within our own field that we can draw from and rely on. I I think there's a lot to be learned from um, active student responding and from engagement. And I think regardless of what format you're talking about, um, the data are clear that active student responding and engagement are associated with better learning outcomes, including retention, right, of Mm -hmm. those skills. I also think we need to look at things like fluency and whether we can embed fluency-based instruction into what we're doing within our own science for practitioners. And there are lots of ways in which that is being explored and done, um, but I think there's opportunity for us to do more. But I think we have a lot of technology from, um, from a lot of different areas of our science that help us with that. Um, some of the work on InterTeach as well, which lends itself to some group instructional formats within online instruction is interesting as well. I'd be happy to send people some resources, some articles. Um, you know, I think we have to kind of start thinking about studying the technology of teaching within our science. Great, great. Uh, yeah, and what we can do is when we eventually publish this episode in the podcast, we can put some of those uh, links oh, in the to. show notes so that way okay. uh, people aren't blowing up your email inbox. So, I love um, that. Excellent. Uh, well, I, I've got a couple more questions for you, but this whole online uh, teaching stuff is, is, is fascinating, so we may come back to that in a second. Are you in need of continuing education? Well, Behavior University is a BACB-approved continuing ed provider, and their mission is to provide 
university quality courses and ABA for new and experienced professionals alike. Their live webinars generally have a limited number of attendees so that the learning experience is highly interactive. And if you can't make the live events, these webinars are recorded and available in Behavior University's CEU library for later viewing. Behavior University also has a 40-hour RBT training. This self-paced course uses a combination of visual presentation, audio lectures, and live video models to teach all areas of the RBT task list. The course is accessible anytime and from anywhere. So if you'd like to learn more, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations, where you'll find a 10% discount for podcast listeners. Again, that's behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And thanks for checking them out. Just more generally, do you have additional thoughts? You know, I, I wanted to talk to you about some of the variability in, in ABA training across different uh, uh, v- verified course sequence providers. There's, there, there, you know, long story short, there's quite a bit of it. And, um, you know, and, and things like publishing pass rates doesn't seem to really have moved the needle, you know. Um, so are there any, I know you spoke about quality in general in terms of inst- online instruction, but do you, if, do you have any additional thoughts about how to improve just the general, you know, Endicott, uh, beyond Endicott, you know, uh, the, the general quality of ABA training? Well, that's a great question. And it's also a question, um, you know, when I think about variability and quality and what people are saying in the field, people certainly talk about it in terms of course sequence work. People talk about it in terms of supervised experience and the quality of supervision people are getting as part of their mentorship. Um, And people talk about it in terms of service provision, right? That that even practitioners um, or organizations provide varying levels of quality. So I think it's a broad issue and it's probably not an issue that's specific to our field, I think variability in quality and variability in outcomes for any educational endeavor, any institution granting degrees has a broad variety of individuals and their outcomes vary. So, I mean, maybe that normalizes it a little bit in that I don't think that um, that our challenges are that different from challenges that other fields have encountered. I think standards are one of the major things that um, can improve that over time. And I see us moving more in that direction. One of the standards that I think recently changed that's so important is having more coursework in the philosophical foundation of the science. Helping individuals to have a scientific worldview and an appreciation for the history of our field, um, I think is a foundational skill that is likely to help them in their academic work, in their practice work, um, and in things like passing the exam. Um, but I, I think that that probably looking to standards and to um, criteria for various kinds of elements of our professional training is probably the answer over time. Okay. All right. Um, I got another kind of a, a big picture question here for you. Um, so I, I've had a, a number of guests on the show, and I've, he- I've heard this, you know, outside of obviously uh, my, um, I guess, uh, circle, if you will. But I've heard people, that, you know, talk about um, uh, a- ABA and the related board certification of, you know, practitioners as being kind of an autism centric uh, endeavor. Um, do you think that's a fair characterization? Is that something we should worry about? Or is it, you know, you know I always think of the saying, you know, you, 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 what's, the, what's that saying? Uh, you, you dance with the person who brought you, you know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I think there's some of that that, you know, but what, what would you say to, to, to someone making that assertion? I mean, it might bother me less than it bothers other people because I have um, devoted so much of my career to the needs of individuals with autism, right? And so I think I hear more of that frustration from individuals that have spent their careers doing just as amazing things with other populations and yet not maybe getting the same kind of recognition um, or desire for others to study it within their fields. Um, You know, I I think it's... um, it's an opportunity for me. It kind of gives me hope. Like I, like I said, in my career, I, you know, 
it, it was not that long ago that we were just a small group of people that nobody paid any attention to. And now we're in this very high demand with thousands of credentialed individuals motivated to spend their careers doing it. So it, it gives me some hope. Maybe it's a model. You know, I think about how did we get there? How did we mobilize and how did we get those entitlements from an insurance perspective and a funding perspective? How did the recognition of the credential lead to the demand for those services in so many contexts? And I think, wouldn't that be great if we could figure out whether there are other high need areas that we could begin to make inroads in in similar ways? And I don't mean to seem naive about that. I mean, some of the problems that face us are unbelievably complex. If you look at the drug addiction problem we have in this country or, um, you know, uh, depression and suicidality in adolescence or eating disorders um, or nursing home management, I think about all of those as being um, very complex, important problems that I wish behavior analysts were a bigger part of trying to solve. And I don't mean to imply that we would solve them easily because mm -hmm. they are among the most complex problems we face as humans. But I would love if some of what's happened in autism could happen in some of those other areas. And it feels possible to me, having been part of what happened in the radical transformation associated with autism. You know, as you're answering that question, a couple of things I'm thinking of that perhaps might have, uh, you know, levers, if you will, that might have kind of tipped the scales in, in the world of autism to where it is right now. You mentioned already, you know, that um, you know, uh, game-changing uh, book by Catherine Maurice, uh, you know, I think there's something like that. And then the, and the, uh, the subsequent parental movement uh, for, for treatment, yes. you know, uh, and, um, you know, I'm trying to think of what would be some other elements that that would need to be marshaled in order to bring about change. You know, but you know, I guess where I'm going is that a lot of this stuff happened outside of behavior anal analysis, or was was fomented by people outside of behavior analysis who saw what we have to offer uh, and develop we these very vocal the constituencies. <laughs> well, I mean, we, you know, I mean, we did, you know, we had to do the work, of course, and had to had to generate the outcomes that made people want to seek out behavioral -like services, of course. But, uh, you know, I, I, I always think of this, okay, what, what were those mobilizing factors and are those mobilizing right. factors available in these, these other kind of constituent groups? And a couple of other groups that, that come to mind for me, I, I do a lot of work in school consultation, particularly with non- you know, individuals who don't have autism and have emotional behavioral challenges. Yes. I mean, that's a gigantic constituency. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there are, there are others as well that whole you know, kind of child welfare at risk population yes. is, 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 is giant, but, you know, some of those other areas are, are you know, especially as you mentioned, addiction, uh, mm -hmm. is, um, um, you know, especially in this day and age, it's just, you know, um, all those, all those, constituencies that you know pat Fryman would say are under the curve if you will so yes yeah um so i guess speaking of of broadening uh, our, our scope if you will i want to spend the last couple of minutes here um with with uh, two, two more questions for you um uh, one, I want to talk a little bit about the LaFrance et al. paper that you were a co-author on that came out recently in the uh, Behavior Analysis and Practice about working with inter interdisciplinary teams. Um, but I also don't want to uh, take up all the, we have uh, about another uh, about another 10 or 15 minutes or so. So I also want to leave room for what advice you might have for a newly minted BCBA. So um, so let's talk about uh, working with, uh, well, playing nicely with others first, and then we'll 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 close with the final question for advice for newly minted. Great. Um, so in my research lab um, at Endicott for the last few years, we've been focusing on what I'm going to broadly call soft skills uh, in a couple of different contexts and looking at um, how we can operationally define and measure and train others to develop, say, compassionate care skills for working with families of individuals with autism and effective collaboration skills for working in interdisciplinary teams. And that really comes out of the clear 
indications that we're not doing as well on those dimensions as we need to. That um, when you know when families are surveyed, they talk about us having our own agenda or um, you know interrupting them or not asking about the health and status of all family members. And um, and in a collaboration context. Um, it seems like many um, individuals from other professions perceive their experiences with behavior analysts to be less than rewarding. They sometimes say we're arrogant or unyielding or in some other way um, difficult to work with. And I, I think it's because, and maybe I think about this because I spend my time teaching and training students of behavior analysis, and I think about the things we're doing so well we're really doing the worldview piece very well. You know, we're giving them the behavior analytic framework and foundation, and we're teaching them that science is your compass and that you are grounded in science. And that's important. But I think what we've missed along the way is how you work with other people who might not ascribe to that worldview. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's um, a gap in our training in certainly in coursework and also in supervised experience where we we haven't um, necessarily targeted the skills that are going to make you more successful. And I think we have to be pragmatic. One of the reasons to do this is to be more successful and to maximize our outcomes. We don't want to become the people in collaborative context that everybody stops listening to because here she goes again. All she likes is ABA. She's going to reject right. anything anyone else says. Right. right. And you can kind of, I can kind of feel that sometimes. I feel like I inherit the, um, the experiences people have had with other behavior analysts. And maybe you feel that way too, right? Yeah, Where, I've also been that person too, or, you know, at, at, at times, you know, if I reflect back on some interactions that I've had with folks, I, you know, I, there's a couple that I would, I would prefer to do over again and, and would come at it from a, 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 a hopefully a wiser point of view. So I have, uh, I, 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 I rail against, but also have been the, the ugly behaviorist, if you will. So, you know. Right. <laughs> and we all have. And, you know, I think one of the things in that article that we talk about is developing an appreciation for the scope of training and competence that other professions have. I think it's really important, especially if you're going to work in a role where you do have a lot of contact with people from other professions, to have a sense of and a respect for the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they're bringing to the table, the topics that they need to weigh in on because they know more than you do. I think that those are things that it's a really good idea for us to start talking about with students of behavior analysis so that they come prepared to those contexts, remembering some of the importance of humility in those contexts and understanding and appreciating some of the contributions that other people can make. And then I think we have to talk about what are some of the skills. If somebody does say, let's do a vest, which we know is not evidence-based, and we know is going to be a waste of instructional time. What is the way to approach that with the team that's going to lead to a better outcome and that's going to lead to us not wasting instructional time and investing in a procedure that's not likely to go anywhere, but in a way that isn't going to necessarily offend people? Yeah, and one of the one of the things I've learned is that you know if you lead with well the science says X Y and Z. Um, Listeners have heard me kind of talk about this before, but you know, not not no one, not many professions have the 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 reverence, if you will, for data. Data aren't reinforcing, if you you know, uh, and, and so using those arguments, I, I've not really had a lot of luck with them sometimes because a lot of people, uh, you know, if I'm working on a you know uh, interdisciplinary team in, in a school setting, um, to be quite honest, m m many fellow practitioners in different fields don't care about what the research says. They're they're really interested in their own. Uh, experiences and things like that and you know take the anecdote over the the, the the data so I think that's just a worldview barrier that we as behavior analysts have to be mindful of I've had a lot of success with sharing position statements um, from other professions because um, I find that I call it like the black hole discussion like if it's just like what Mary Jane thinks about vests versus what Matt thinks about vests it's probably not a good conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> right because we're not going to come to any middle ground there. But I find that if I can bring in position statements from other fields, 
it can often be a much more productive conversation. And I think that's another example of how we can be kind of insular and maybe we're not borrowing from allied fields in ways that could increase our outcomes. Like the American Academy of Pediatrics has position statements against AIT and facilitated communication and sensory-based interventions. And ASHA has position statements against many different things, including a fantastic newish one on RPM, on rapid prompting method. And even AOTA has in its most recent version of recommendations for autism recommended against the use of vests. So I love talking wow. about position statements. That is a great tip. Uh, that is that is definitely. Uh, de- I'm definitely going to use. That. I'm writing that down right I now. Have a, I have a whole folder of them on my laptop. That makes me very happy every time I see it. So if you want oh, me yeah. to see those along, I can. Please do. Please do. Wow, cool. Um, all right. So we just have a couple minutes left. So I want to ask you. Uh, you know, you spent a, a large part of your career uh, training behavior analysts, putting practitioners out there in the world. What advice uh, do you have for a newly minted BCBA? Um, I think probably the thing I say most often to um, students finishing the programs that we have are um, remember what you don't know. Know your limitations. Knowing your limitations is more important than knowing your strengths because harm can come when you move into areas that you're not competent in. And so I think having a really good sense of what one's limitations of training and supervised experience are is really, really important. I also think it's important to kind of embrace being new in the field, recognizing that you're a junior member of the profession, that that's a phase of anyone's career, and that the need for mentorship is normative and essential for you to become a really great practitioner mid-career. And so I think um, sometimes we might inadvertently deliver the message like, okay, now you're done and you're ready. And instead, I think the message should be, you are ready to begin this journey. You still need a lot of support. You need to embed those supports. Let's talk about what kinds of ways you're going to make sure you have the appropriate supports and mentorship that you need as you start this next phase. And then the last thing I would say is, I think, and this is for everybody, not just the newly minted people, but be a lifelong learner and remember that best practice is a moving target. I started graduate school in 1984 and um, everything, everything that I learned about teaching kids with autism and managing challenging behaviors is now either antiquated or unethical. And I mean that a hundred percent. What we did was bizarre by today's standards. And I, I think all the time about that because I think I hope 35 years from now, everything I'm teaching my students will be antiquated or unethical because that will mean the field has kept moving and we have identified better and more effective ways to do the work that we do. And I, I just think people who are um, stuck in the 1980s which I could have been, you know, are not doing best practice anymore. And so that has to be a message. The the literature shows us that people tend to do what they learned to do in their early years of training and mentorship. And that's not the outcome you want. You want to be constantly evolving and moving with the field. You know, Mary Jane, I've had many guests make similar points, but never quite as, uh, uh, I don't know. I think all three of those things that you just mentioned, they all kind of link together and are, 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 are a very important message. So thank you for, for sharing that. I love the idea that uh, being junior is normative. That is uh, that's definitely uh, something I'll, again, there's a lot of things coming out of this conversation that I'll be stealing in my own verbal behavior. So I appreciate you providing that. Um, Great. I, I think, uh, let's see, I think we have just a uh, a few minutes left on the clock. I'm just going to open the Q&A chat to see if anyone has a comment or a question, and then, uh, sure. then we can wrap this up. All right. Um, if you have a comment or a question for Dr. Weiss, just go ahead and put it in there. I'm hoping I'm using this uh, <laughs> correctly here. All right. Um, 
Okay, I don't have any right now. So I think what I'm going to do then is just, uh, uh, we'll just leave it here. And um, Mary Jane, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a fun conversation. There's a million different directions we could have taken this <laughs> with the various topics. And so uh, I'd like to, to have you back and maybe we can expand on some of these topics uh, in I a little would bit love more to detail. Come back. This went by too fast for me. So, all right. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>